First of all, sorry for the delay and for several reasons. I wouldn't bother you with the reasons, so we'll just kick off. I think the most important thing is to, to thank you guys for coming. Um, these are pretty unholy hours of burning. <laughs> some people went to bed at 3 o'clock in the morning, but others. So, but thanks for coming. <laughs> so, our. Uh, I'll, I'll do it this way. I'll, I'll read something, and basically, half of it will be about thanking people. Because to make such a thing possible, such an ambitious program, you need so many people, so many hands. So, you can block your ears, so you just need to uh, open to know who was part of it. So, I'll start by thanking the ICI for giving us the space and for collaborating with us in this, in this project. So, um, and then, um, thank the, the panelists for accepting our invitation and for coming, most of them coming to Berlin for this, and all the artists and, and the performers. Then the other collaboration partners, the like Cooler, Peninsula, Labor Kritische Europäische Europäisierungsforschung and the Bundeszentrale für Politische Bildung and Goethe Institute Nigeria that kind of helped us. They put some some grease to the elbow, <laughs> you know, so facilitated the project a bit. So thank you for that. But most especially um, the 20 or more savvy people. Um, that work day and night to make such projects possible on a voluntary basis. Um, rebels in their own right and um, you know, hard workers and that believe in making sadly not just a parable but reality. So thank you all for that. So, on this day, in this same city, Exactly 130 years ago, representatives of some 14 nations had just finished packing their bags. And were about to board whatever. They had just finished a conference that lasted over three months, each of them heading back with a piece of a cake called Africa. They had come to Berlin to seek for a place in the sun. That's the way the African continent was so poetically called by its butchers. Today, 130 years later, we invited a couple of people, thinkers and practitioners, some of them descendants of the people that sat on that table, some of them descendants of the people that were not allowed to sit on that table, to come and deliberate with us on the psychological destinies and the impacts, the ideological, the economic, political, and humanitarian repercussions of that conference on today's society. So we do so because we are of the opinion that you cannot isolate the past from the, from the present. And as banal as that might sound, the past frames the present. So I would like to say that in Michel Rolf Trio's words, Thank you. There is a microphone. So I would like to say that in Michel of Trier's words, in silence in the past. But the past does not exist independently from the present. Indeed, the past is only past because there is a present. Just as I can point to something over there only because I am here. But nothing is inherently over there or here. In that sense, the past has no content. The past, and more accurately, pastness, is a position. Thus, in no way can we identify the past as past. So the project is in Ade Berlin 1884 to 2014. is to us an effort to go beyond that chronological and temporal aspect of pastness. But to look at the past as that space whose positions and concepts are reflected or refracted into the present. In that sense, with this project, we intend to critically reflect on what I mentioned before. So, 
philosophical, economical, political, humanitarian justifications that were progenitors on the one hand, but also cornerstones of colonialism and colonial practices. And that until today still frame, you know, these neoliberal algorithms that are the pillars of the society. But I'd like to take a moment to reflect on, on the concept of refraction which I'm proposing today. The refraction of the past and the present. So while the past can be reflected in the present, the concept of refraction, which in physics, and some people <laughs> are specialists in that, demands a breaking of waves, a deflection, a redirection of waves, when they pass from one medium to the other, mediums of different densities. So it's a matter of certainty that most of the concepts in that past, in that set of pastness, with which the Berlin Congo Conference was framed, and other, you know, be it slavery, be it neocolonialism, whatever, were possible through dehumanization concepts, completely stripping individuals and societies of their, of their own subjectivity and their rights. Now, any effort to silence history, in any case of, of direct reflection of the past into the present, might be a possibility of smoothening continuity. So, so to say, you know, causing repetitions. It is for that reason that I want to consider the past and the present as mediums of our identities. And in the process of refraction of, of positions and concepts, of ideologies, of practices, um, then we could, we could understand better what we are trying to do today, what we are trying to do with the project, sadly in general and, and this project in particular. So I would like to understand Simon Jamie's concept of the intruder in the exhibition museum under Berlina. So the intruder being those people that were not on that table in 1884. So I would like to understand this concept as one of the possibilities of refracting. But refraction of the past in the present also exists in artistic expression, in poetry, in fiction. Refraction also comes up in all the processes of decolonization. And the last example that I would like to give of refraction is, is the guerrilla, the political and the social one, the artistic one. And that's where we see Sabi, because he never saw us coming. <laughs> so in the next days, we will discuss the five panels Western ethnology and the, as a discipline and ethnological museums and their relations to colonial practices. About the problems around representation of non-Western cultures and the, and the relationship and consequences that, and the future of colonial collections in ethnological museums in the West. That will be in panel five that will be moderated by Anna Yeager. So the title of that panel is How to Read Between the Lines, A Brief History of Things That Are Not Mine. On colonialism and technology collections. In panel four, we will reflect together on new forms of political and economic intrusions in new colonial and, and colonial structures, especially in the African continent but also beyond. So that will be laid through the outward trappings of sovereignty that will be moderated by Elena Agudio and Saskia Kipshaw. The panel before that, panel three, will also be on intrusion, on enacting and enacted citizenships, where we will try to question and reformulate concepts of citizenship in Europe, in a Europe of flourishing nationalism and racism, as it deals with issues of migration and border and identity politics. Panel two will be titled Contested Geopolitics Before and After the Scramble. So panel three will be moderated by Elena Agudio, and panel two will be moderated by Saskia Kepcher, and we'll discuss relations and geopolitics between West and non-Western uh, countries before and after the Berlin Congo Conference. So, for panel one, we will 
we'll dis discuss the silencing and the unsilencing of history. So we will situate ourselves in, 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 in Berlin, but go beyond uh, uh, Berlin, of course. And we will try to look at, at the colonial history in a, in, a big, in a bigger context. So not only taking 1884, which seems to be a starting point, but is not a starting point. We are very much aware of, of colonial uh, practices, um, especially between Europe and Africa, that did back uh, to the 16th century. So we'll look at especially ways of unsilencing uh, those histories that were silenced for some reason or the other. And for that, we invited actually, I, I made a mistake of inviting also two of my compatriots. <laughs> One of them being Ashim Bembe, and the other being Billy Bijota. And my compatriots Bijota, they just don't turn up when you're invited. <laughs> Despite everything. But we are very happy to have <laughs> so we're very happy to have two um, on board um, for the panel. So Bilgen Ayata and Alessandro Triosi. So um, I will start by introducing uh, Bilgen. And we will do it in, in this way. It is supposed to be a conversation. So they will present a position paper, and then we go directly into questioning. You know, so then the other person takes over and does a, 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 a short presentation. And we, we discuss at the end of the presentation. We get into a bigger uh, discussion. So that's how it's, it's, that's how we do it. So Bibi Nayata is uh, a lecturer at the Fire University of Berlin. She received her PhD from the Department of Political Science at John Hopkins University and uh, uh, MA in Political Science from uh, New York University in Toronto. So, remind me, I will do a detailed uh, introduction, just uh, also a matter of respect, so there uh, should be time for that. Wait. We will introduce ourselves in a few words. This is too academic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> At least to, to, know, to, to, to know who is, is, is talking and what the points of interest are. So in any case, uh, Bilgin Ayata's current research compares Germany's denial of the colonial past and the genocide of the Herero and Nama to Turkey's denial of the Armenian genocide. I think that's very important uh, to, 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 to be said, you know. Yeah, but we're starting much worse. <laughs> no. So, uh, Alexander Triussi is a former professor of Sub-Saharan African History at uh, the Oriental University of Naples. So he has published extensively on Ethiopia and colonial uh, photography and post-colonial violence. Does that suffice? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. So, where do we start from? We need this, huh? We are recording. Um, let me start by just saying that I had trouble finding the place. <laughs> and once I was here, I had trouble finding, you know, the room. There was no sign. Which, you know, brings the point that all, the only sign is an A4 small bit, bit of paper in front of one door. But I asked four people, inside and outside of the compound, nobody knew about the conference. And this is not the fault of the organizers, although it is. <laughs> but it means that to look for, you know, colonial past everywhere, is you have to search um, and strive, because most of our colonial past is silenced. And, and there is a, you know, it, it is symbolic that um, this is part of a tense past that is always sort of thrown back in the past and isolated in the past. 
and rarely connected to the present. Now, but I would do forgot to say what I wanted him to say, rather, which is not just that I'm, I'm, I'm a somewhat of an academic, but that for the past 10 years I've been involved in uh, collecting uh, migrant stories. People were coming to Europe. And some of these people were coming from old Italian colonies. So these were the descendants of ex-colonial subjects who were coming back to the old metropolis. And, but very rarely the two things you know, in the media are explained or told and there was a very nice Eritrean guy who, when the police told him that he was expelled from Italy because he had no documents, he said, but please, you have been in my country for 60 years, uninvited. Allow me to stay for 60 years, and then we go. You know, I mean, this sort of click um, is it's, it's, uh, just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. So, I come from a country with, uh, where colonial past has been mixed up with fascism. The loss, we, we still call the loss of colonies. And the end of the short-lived Italian empire. Italian East Africa Empire, which lasted only five years. But, you know, some 500,000 Italians went through the colonial past and they have, you know, in the attic of these families, there are lots of things to remind them of this past. Pictures, photos, um, exotic objects. At times, other lives that they have produced while they uh, in the colonies. And all this, you know, has been so traumatic because the end of Italian Africa was connected with the end of fascism, the end of empire, and with the loss of colonies, that it was put aside. Something not to be remembered. Official, institutional. Last year, we had a whole year-round celebration of um, conferences, um, on Italian unity, not one single workshop or conference was organized on Italy's colonial period because Italy's colonial period is part of the making of Italians. And this is something that you know we should not uh, forget. And if Italian society reacts to today's African or non-European, non-Italian people coming to Italy, it is because they have gone through the colonial period and they have not questioned it. <coughs> and they have not questioned it because at schools very little attention is given to these things. And memory, which is not transmitted, goes. And as a historian, I found myself in a very tricky position. I went to Ethiopia, and Ethiopia has been my area of research. And I've taught African history for 40 years. <coughs> but I studied the margins of Ethiopia. 
I studied the borders of Ethiopia. And I'm, I've always been called a peripheralist. That is, you know, a non a marginal sort of scholar. Someone who works in a not at the center, but at the border. All the yes. Because, but, you know, we believe that borders and peripheries talk about the center much more vividly than no, say what the center is all about, um, much more so than the great tale of the center of, about the center. So I never studied really the Italian period. I stayed away from Italians. I went, was away from Alessandro I stayed away from the, from the Italian cultural center in Alessandro uh, I was there to study Ethiopian history. I learned the language, I spoke the language, and I went 300 kilometers away from the capital. But then I was taken in. I was meant to say totally other different stories, but I was yesterday evening between one dance and the other, informed by the chairman that, you know, Someone was not coming, and so he said, you say something also about how you, how you ended up being what you're doing. And this is why, but I mean, please stop me and... Uh, yes. but, uh, but your talk is interesting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Especially because of the introduction, so it's fine to see where the... And this is a very long introduction. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, but I was called to reason about the Italian colonial past in 1996, while I was teaching at the University of Addis Ababa. And there was the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Alba, which may mean very little to you, but it is another of the traumas of Italian society, because it is a battle where Emperor Menelik defeated a proper European army. 7,000 officers and soldiers were killed in one day on the Italian side. End, end, which is not just end, their African troops which were Eritreans. I will come later to the problems that the, this has created. And I was there 100 years later, and as I was then, you know, regularly going to the Department of History in Addis Ababa, we, as a department, pushed on Italian authorities to take part in the celebrations, the, the anniversary celebration. And they say, no, no, it's impossible. It's impossible. You lock the elections in four months. You want the right to win the elections? We can't talk about it. So we organized students, scholars who went there. And and to me, you know, I said, but look, it's 100 years. Can we mourn? Can we not mourn together Ethiopians and Italians and Eritreans who died for different reasons, but they died for heaven's sake. They died on that day. 100 years after, can we not mourn them? Together. Huh? Politics has its own reasons. So, of course, they sent, you know, a minor delegation and, uh, you know, just to please. But the Ethiopians were not happy. They were not happy not only because of, uh, of the Adwa sort of uh, shyness of Italian society. 
it was a debate in East whether it was, this was right or wrong and whether the government should send more people and so on. But this is not so interesting. The real interesting thing was that the Ethiopian government, the new Ethiopian government, because it had reached, it had gone into power only five years before that, after 17 years of dictatorship, of military dictatorship. This government came from the north, which means Tigran. And from the, in the north, there is a very famous uh, city called Aksu, that some of you may have heard, <laughs> which is considered by Ethiopia to be the heart of Ethiopia. And from Aksu, Mussolini, in 1937, stole an obelisk and took it, ordered it to go to Rome to celebrate the 15th anniversary of the march to Rome. It was a very important fascist occasion. And the obelisk was to be put in front of the main party building which was under construction there. By the way, that building went to the United Nations and it's now called Food and Agriculture yeah. Organization, the FAO building in Rome. In 1947, 